your seed will be planted deep and let there be deliverance today. Let there be healing today. Let there be fruit today. That your will would be accomplished in us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. And you may be seated in Jesus' name. So I uh, don't find it uh, odd that Brother Tyler opened with some of the very scriptures and texts that I'll be covering today because we are born of the same Spirit. Amen? Y'all was probably reading some of these scriptures this week. Amen for those of you who read. Small pun, small jab, small reminder. (laughs) Three things that weaken us. And that opening portion of Scripture in verse 7 teaches us that if we sow to the flesh, we're going to, of the flesh, reap corruption. The key here is the word corruption itself. And that word corruption is the word thora, and it means to decay, to ruin. In the country, we can look at a tree or a fruit or something, a house that's falling apart, and we would say, man, that thing is ruined. We kind of combine T's and D's and all that stuff together, past tense, present tense, and all kind of other words. But we might look at it and say it's ruined, even though... It's not completely gone. It's ruined. And the word also interprets destroy or perish. It comes from another word, which is the word thyro, which means to waste away, to shrivel, to wither, to self-corrupt, or to defile. So the first weakness I want to talk to us about today is sowing to the flesh. Sowing to the flesh. Now in Galatians 5, chapter 19 through 21, I'm going to read to you from the complete Jewish Bible. She'll have it up in the King James. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says this, and it is perfectly evident what the old nature does. Everybody say, what my flesh does. It expresses itself or manifests itself through sexual immorality, impurity, and indecency. In other words, when your flesh is leading, this is what's going to be produced. Verse 20, involvement with the occult and with drugs. And here's the ones I really want to hone in for us today. Infuting, fighting, becoming jealous, getting angry, often in selfish ambition, Factionalism, which means to create divisions. Nothing better to do that than gossip, slander, and backbiting. Intrigue. Now that word sounds cool, but it really just means to be suspicious. It means to be, uh, I guess suspicious is the best word, to be, to, for something to be an intrigue, it, it, it's very suspicious, it's curious. You know, and some people won't go around and say, uh, I have the gift of discernment. No, you don't, you're just suspicious. Because if you're in your flesh, the Spirit's not going to operate. So your flesh has an opposite of what the Spirit has because they war with each other. And so where the Spirit might discern, your flesh is just going to be suspicious. And question everything and... All things. Verse 21. And envy. And drunkenness. Not necessarily just in wine, but just excess. Once you start catering to the flesh, guess what? It's not satisfied. It wants more and more and more until it is gluttonous and drunken on whatever it desires. Orgies and things like these. I warn you now, as I have warned you before... Those who do such things will have no share in the kingdom of God. No share in the kingdom of God. And so those, those main things, the feuding, the fighting, the jealousy, the 
angry. And anger comes from two places, and probably more than that, but there are two bases for anger. Anger, uh, number one, can come as a secondary reaction to hurt. First, somebody that we love or we depend on or we trust betrays us and it hurts. And then the next reaction is anger. Now you're angry at the person who you love. The other thing about anger is this. If I can't control it, it frustrates me. And so anger is either a secondary reaction to hurt, or anger is I'm frustrated because I just can't control it. And trust me, your flesh loves being in control. Your flesh loves being in control. Romans 14, 17, notice it said, the closing that scripture says, I've warned you, told you before, if these things are running your life, you cannot share in the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? We know that the kingdom of God, in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat, it's not drink, but it's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. So if the Holy Ghost is leading, there's righteousness. If the Holy Ghost is leading, there's peace. If the Holy Ghost is leading, there's joy. But you're not going to share in that joy, share in that peace, or share in that righteousness if the Spirit's not leading. You're going to struggle with the anger and the jealousy and the bitterness and the, and the fighting and the feuding if your flesh is leading and the Spirit is not leading. And just look at those three things, righteousness, peace, and joy. Does that sound like something weak? This is not a weakness. It's a strength. Because when you can have peace in the middle of a storm, that's valuable. When you can be joyous and there's all kind of mess going on around you, that's valuable. And righteousness just means you're right. It's not self-righteousness. It's His righteousness, and that means you're not going to do something wrong. You're going to walk in His right ways. That's a strength. It's not a weakness. First of all, if you have never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you've never experienced speaking in other tongues, then your weakness is not only your flesh, but that weariness is from the sin in your life. It's the Holy Ghost and the baptism of the Holy Ghost that regenerates us, that empowers us to say no to sin, to remove sin. But if you have not received that baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're going to become weak. You're going to become weary because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. In other words, the only thing sin's going to pay you is death. And it's going to do it very slowly as it destroys and it decays and it works all kind of unrighteousness. And that's why the scripture says in Isaiah 28 and 11 through 12, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest. This is the rest, wherein ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not here and it, so it is the baptism of the spirit speaking in other tongues that brings us true rest sometimes we like to go golfing but that's not really rest that's recreation sometimes we want to uh, play ball or do something else other than work because we're tired of work or we're weak from work but really that's recreation it's not rest the true rest comes from the spirit of god the true rest comes from our Creator who said on the seventh day, don't do nothing but rest. Rest. And He said, I'm going to give you the seventh. He gave us the Sabbath. The Holy Ghost is our Sabbath. And He's Lord of the Sabbath. So when His Spirit came in, He brings us this rest that our bodies and our spirit is weary from the sin that's decaying and rottening and wearing us out. Sin is an evil taskmaster. 
Sin's rough. Oh, it's pleasurable for a little bit. But then it comes with such chains and such bondage and such weight and such weariness and such trouble, such drama. The only drama in the kingdom of God is when we're on display with our praise. That's good drama. Not this negative drama that drains and weakens and, and, and the things that our flesh will bring. Secondly, after we've received the, best, the, the born again experience, you know, it's called several things the born again, born again of the Spirit, or the baptism of the Holy Ghost, or receiving the Holy Ghost. Once you have this and we've entered the kingdom, if we're not careful, we can cause our spirit to dehydrate. You ever been in this heat that's going on right now outside, working the yard, and suddenly you got nothing. You, you don't feel like picking up a foot. You don't feel like picking up an arm. You're just like, let me get to a shade and a seat, something to drink, some food. Lord, if I could just have some AC right now. Why? Because you've become dehydrated. You've let the water through the form of sweat empty out of your body because of the heat and the humidity so you don't have enough to keep you going through hydration. The same thing can happen in the Spirit. When you are not praying, when you are not praying in the Spirit, you're not rehydrating. There are many references to the Spirit being water. It's referenced and typed like water. It refreshes like water. It re, it, it, the Bible says that it would be like living rivers flowing out of our belly. What does it do? It brings life. So the Spirit brings life. And if you're kind of weak in the Spirit, you might be spiritually dehydrated. But speaking in other tongues refreshes us. And, and this dehydration of the Spirit will do what to our faith? It, it just kind of pulls it and drags it down and... We become weary by what? Feuding and fighting. We don't have enough spirit to help us resist opening our mouth. And, and, and then we're going to give our piece of our mind to somebody. And then you give enough pieces of your mind and you ain't got no mind left. People driving me out of my mind. No, you gave it all away. I'm give you a piece of my mind. Well, careful, you ain't got a whole lot of that left. So we, 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 if we have the Holy Ghost, it'll quicken us. Well, don't say that. It'll quicken it. Just let it go. The Holy Ghost helps catch us before we make a mess out of speaking something we shouldn't speak. But we become weary by feuding and fighting and jealousies and anger and even selfish ambition when we're trying to pursue our goals and not His goals. We'll, be get, we'll get weary because he's not working with us then because we're going the opposite direction that he wants us to go in. And so Jude 1 and 20 says, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Sometimes we just need to refuel on the Holy Ghost. When you're at your worst, get in a corner somewhere and pray and start talking to Jesus until you begin to pray in tongues and speak in tongues and pray in the Holy Ghost so He can refresh you, renew you, and help you with a sound mind and control your flesh. Don't say that. Don't do that. Don't. 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 You know, most times... You have to withhold your flesh. It don't need a lot of motivation. <laughs> the only time you need to motivate your flesh is when it needs to work. But when it wants to express itself and all the feuding and anger and jealousy, it don't need motivation. It needs restraint. And that's why we've got to have the spirit or else the flesh will weaken us. Listen to what uh, the Apostle Paul had to say about this. 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 6, he said, For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. Everybody say weary. We was weary. But we were troubled on every side. Without 
were fightings. Within were fears. Fear will drain you. Fear will make you weak. Fear will cause you to be afraid of things that aren't there. The enemy just deposits a little fear and walks away, and you think he's all throughout your house and your life. He ain't even there. He just drops fear in your spirit. You received it, acted on it, and now that within your flesh, they work together and make a mess. And he's on down the road somewhere. So he said, within were fears. Nevertheless, watch this, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now, my wife has a ringtone. And it says, people get on my nerves sometimes. And it just goes on. People get on my nerves sometimes. Now, how many of you in the building aren't people? I didn't think so. So the people get on the people's nerves. We get on each other's nerves. And uh, this can happen. We go to the workplace, and there's co-workers. Maybe they're not spirit-filled. Maybe they're not Christians. But they take a toll on your spirit. Because you're trying to control yourself and you're trying to behave yourself and you're not wanting to get involved in their dirty jokes and you're not wanting to get involved in their cursing and their foul mouths and these things are wearying you. And you go through that all week long. And then how many of you, when you get to the house of God, you come in and you see a brother, you see a sister, it's kind of like a quickening, yeah, hey, bro! We made it another week. It's so good to see somebody who loves Jesus. That's why the scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but do it more as you see the day approaching. Why? Because the enemy's goal through the spirit of Antichrist is to weary the saints. I'm going to weary you. What am I going to weary you with? I'm going to weary you with fear. I'm going to weary you with, where's my next meal going to come from? I'm going to weary you with, is the economy going to crash? I'm going to weary you with, is the mark on its way? I'm going to weary you with rumors and speculation. And he ain't showed up yet. But the Spirit is working to weary us. So we'll cave when he comes on the scene. I don't know about you, but I don't plan on caving. I plan on the Lord strengthening me. I know where my help comes from. The sooner you know where your help comes from, the more able you are to stand. Revelations 3, 7 through 8, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works... Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it. Listen to what he says. For you have a little strength. You got a little strength. Why did you have a little strength? Because you kept my word, and you have not denied my name. You need to know where your strengths are. When you're feeling weak, you got to go back to your strengths. When, you, when you're feeling weak, and you're quick-tempered, and and, 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 and you're loose-tongued and, 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 and you know you shouldn't be feeling all this and doing all this and letting your flesh kind of lead. you got to go back where your strength is. Jesus, I need your name. I need your spirit. I need you to help calm me. You need to call on the Prince of Peace to bring peace in. You have strengths, but you've got to call on them. And you've gotten out of kilter by letting your flesh lead. And when flesh lead, it weakens us. But we are stronger, no matter what, together. You have a little strength. We stand for his name together. Amen? Amen. We stand for his spirit together. We stand for the gospel together. Second thing that will weary us. Second thing that's going to try to weaken us. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which dost weaken 
the nations. So Satan will try to weaken you. Number one, our flesh will weaken us. But number two, Satan will try to weaken you. He tries to bring down nations. And if you're in the middle of that nation, you're going to feel his power and his working. Luke chapter 22, 31 through 32, the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Thank the Lord Jesus prayed for me. And if Jesus prayed for you, you know, we all got prayer warriors in our life. We're thankful when we say, I prayed for you. We feel, whoo, we feel strength. But to know that Jesus prayed for you, you ought not doubt anymore. Jesus prayed for me. But he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And what's going to happen at the end of time? He said he's going to have to look for faith. Because faith is going to be weakened in the earth. And when thou art converted, he told Peter, go strengthen your brother. When you're converted, go strengthen your brother. Look at this. Satan will sift you as wheat. To sift, the wheat means to separate the grain from the chaff when you're dealing with wheat. Okay? So the wheat is spread on this hard floor, whether it's concrete or it's slab or it's stone, or perhaps it's a, they, they'll tamper down an area to make it really hard and firm so it won't give. And they spread that wheat from harvest on that floor. And then they take what's called a flail. And this flail is a wooden staff with a short, heavy stick on the end. And they, they swing, and they smash, and they beat that wheat. They beat on it. You ever felt like you've been beat all week? It came from this side, and it came from that side. And I feel like I got beat up on the job today. I, I had a family meeting. I, got, I felt like I got beat up in that, and I had an encounter with a relative. And I felt like I got beat. Everybody's just beating on me. Satan is trying to sift you as wheat, and that's a beating process. And when the flailing has taken place, that beating has taken place on that wheat, uh, what happens is it breaks that harder outer shell that's called the chaff or the chafe and it, so that it can be removed and the only thing that r remains is that edible grain or that wheat kernel. That's what we're after because from the wheat kernel, that's where our flour comes from. That's the source of our flour. And when you have flour, it makes what? Bread. And so if you want some good bread in your life, you're going to have to get some beatings. Ain't that fun? How many of you ever went up to mom and dad and said, I ain't had a beating in a week. Can I have another one? Beat me today. I've been pretty good for two weeks, and I haven't had a beating. Would you just beat me today? It's been a while. In fact, we hope they forget. You're driving in the car. When you get home, I'm going to beat you. And you're back there going, if I beat really good between now and home, maybe they'll forget. But if you're going to be successful in the kingdom of God, you must become edible. We're not cannibals. But Jesus said, you have to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. Why? Because he's edible. He's digestible. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. There's always a burden. There's always a yoke. But when you're carrying it with him, it can be easy and it can be light. But when you're trying to do your own thing, we need some of his yoke. So if you're going to be successful in the kingdom of God, you must become edible. There was a man I knew that 
learned how to be strong with the word. He learned how to debate the gospel. He learned how he knew he knew where to go and turn. And he would try to witness to people. But he wouldn't pray. And so he was sharp with the word. He was good with where to go and what to say. But he never knew when to lay up on the beaten. <laughs> and so he come in, they're they going to get it, they need to have it. And what happens? Self flesh righteousness rises up because I, I have a sword and it's powerful. But that's why we need the Spirit of God to help us know how to wield the sword. So that sword becomes a scalpel and not a bludgeoning, killing object. So is the spirit of religion. It's a bludgeoning, killing object. That's why the Pharisees couldn't even recognize Jesus because they were so enthrottled and, and, and possessed by that, that religious spirit. They had no relationship with the word that they knew. They knew the word, but they didn't know the word in flesh. They couldn't see what it meant. And so... John 12 and 24 says, Verily, verily, and this fellow I was talking about, he went up with, he would get in fights with people. And I don't mean just arguments. I mean fights with people over the Word of God. Meaning, bruh, where's your Holy Ghost? We ain't supposed to be fighting people. We're supposed to be saving people. John 12, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And so, think of it like this. The master farmer has employed the master sifter. <laughs> To beat you and whip you and weaken you until you're edible. In other words, the enemy enjoys it and God lets him do it, but he only lets him go so far. But he will allow him to get all those hard, rough edges off of you. He'll allow him to break that shell of self-righteousness and break that shell of religious spirits and break that shell to where you are now edible. It, someone will listen to what you have to say because you have a gentle and a meek spirit. We're not going to come at you the first time we see you. Repent or burn! It's not going to go very far. It's not going to go very far. No, no, no. Don't judge me! But if you come in with love and you bring the, love, the word with love and talk about the benefits of the kingdom, someone's more likely to hear you because you're more edible. He said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savor, what good is it? We become more flavorable sometimes in our weakness. Listen to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Paul is speaking, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the re revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. And so he had a thorn in his flesh. Who was it? It was a messenger of Satan. I don't know if that was his mother-in-law. I don't know. I don't know if that was his co-worker. Maybe it was memories of the people that he had had killed when he was Saul. Whatever that messenger of Satan was, it would buffet him. It would beat him. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect. In weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. 
For when I am weak, then am I strong. Then am I strong. When you give Him all of your strength, even the strength you have left sometimes, Come on, how many times you drug in here on Thursday night? You drug in here on Sunday. Just come on, flesh. Just get to the house. But you drag anyway. You take that little strength and you drag that carcass right up in here. Because <laughs> you know I'm going to leave here feeling better than when I came. But that flesh is loud all the way there. You should have rolled over. You could have had another hour's sleep. We could have had a pancake breakfast today. We could have gone to Huddle House or Waffle House. Why are we going in there? Because you ain't the one that needs to be fed. My spirit needs to be fed. You give him all your strength until all that's left is weakness. Then his strength is made perfect. It's made mature in you. It's made complete in you. His strength fills in all the gaps. Fills in the areas where you have no more strength. I have no more strength to carry on. Guess what? That's when he carries you. I got no more strength to fight. And that's why he says, I will fight for you. I got no more strength to run. And that's when he says, don't worry about it. I'll walk with you. I got no more strength to stand. Don't worry about that. I'll lift you up and hold you with my right hand. His grace is sufficient. It'll take care of it. It'll bridge the gap when your weakness is your flesh and your strength is His Spirit. Philippians 4 and 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 1 Peter 5 and 6 teaches us this. Humble yourselves. Will we learn that means? Cast yourself down before or therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care on Him. Just cast it all on Him. I don't know how this is going to work out. I'm tired of trying to figure out how it's going to work out. Jesus, you see it. I'm just giving it to you and I'm walking away from it. It's the best thing you can do. It's the best thing you can do. For he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil is not God's adversary. He has no equal. He has no rival. You are his adversary. You're the other created being that he bestowed so much jewels on. Lucifer was the son of the morning. He was jeweled. He was beautiful. He was next to God. And then he lost all that. So he's jealous of us and he seeks us out to destroy us because we have replaced him. He says, he's as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It shouldn't take you long that when you feel like mumbling and complaining because this is going wrong and that's going wrong and it's not going the way I want it to today, it shouldn't take you long to pull all that complaining in and just think about the people who are giving their lives for the gospel in Africa and Nigeria and China and other places. No, I, 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 my afflictions are light. In America, my afflictions are light. My feelings are real but my afflictions are light. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, listen to what He says, after that ye have suffered a little while, make you perfect, and He will establish you, and strengthen you, and settle you. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the second weakness... The second thing that weakens us is Satan. He will try to weaken us. I'm going to close with the third thing. The third thing that brings weakness to us, and I believe your spirits are going to go, yep, that's it. The third thing that weakens us is compassion fatigue.
Now, I've got a definition for that, but I'm going to tell you one I've learned. When you want more for somebody else than they want for themselves. Compassion fatigue. In fact, I looked this up, and I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to incorporate what the, what the uh, Wikipedia, whatever it's called, says compassion fatigue is. And I want you to think spiritually. I want you to think about your life as a witness. And a, and a Christian. Compassion fatigue is the feeling that you have no more empathy left to give. I've given to this one and they walked away. I've given to this one and they turned their back on me. I've given to this one and they betrayed me. I've given to this one and they don't care. They could care less. They'll go wherever they can go to get it. They're a goat. They eat anything, good, bad, or ugly. But they're wearing you out. Because you're the compassionate one giving. It often strikes health care workers, first responders, because they see that all the time. It, their compassion's pulled on all the every day. First responders, law enforcement officers, at home caregivers. And can you imagine those who work with hospice? You see death every day or at least weekly. And I may add this, it strikes the ministry, and it strikes the saint. Here are the warning signs of compassion fatigue. It's a feeling of helplessness and powerlessness in the face of patient suffering. Reduced feelings of empathy and sensitivity. Feeling overwhelmed and exhausted by work demands, or shall I say kingdom demands, or shall I say church demands, or shall I say witness demands, or shall I say word demands, or shall I say these people, Lord. Get on my nerves sometimes. Boy, if I could cue her to play that every few seconds. Huh? That'd be great right now, wouldn't it? Feeling detached. Numb, emotionally drained, and disconnected. Loss of interest in activities you used to enjoy because you are compassion fatigued. And there are four stages of compassion fatigue. Number one, your zealot of idealistic phase, the zealot phase, the zealot phase. You're excited, you're ready to go, woo! And then you have the withdrawal phase. <laughs> and then you have the irritable phase. Oh, one more time. Here we go again. They're going to do me the same way the last one did me. And then we have the last phase, and that is the zombie phase. Now my emotions are whipped, my compassion's exhausted. And I'm just kind of going through the motions like a zombie with no passion and no life. You're just a cog in the middle of the wheel going through the routines. There's no energy to do it. There's no desire to do it. There's not even a passion anymore. Now, I'm just doing it because I'm supposed to. And in business, I'm just doing it because I get paid. That's why customer service drops to the floor during compassion fatigue or burnout, as it's often called. Mark chapter 7, verse 6 through 8, listen to what Jesus kind of hits this zombie phase, okay? He, he answered and said to them, Well hath Isaiah the prof, prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honored me with their lips, but their heart is far. From me. Zombie phase. Zombie living for God phase. You're just going through the motions, but you hadn't made a heart connection in a long time. You haven't made a spirit connection in a long time. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God. Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. 
you know, when you keep going and keep doing the work of the Lord without the Lord. It happens. We do it. Guilty. Revelations 2, 1 through 5 says this. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And has borne and has patience. And for my name's sake has labored and you have not fainted. Verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you. Just, you know, told them everything they did right. Everything they're doing good. Everything they're commended for. And then he says, but there's, there's just one thing. You left. Your first love. Now you're doing it for the sake of doing it. You forgot why you're doing it. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. What is the first love? What is the first works? Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 31. One of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart. All, everybody say all. All, all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Even if it's a little, he wants all of it. This is the first commandment. He doesn't want the leftovers. The leftovers aren't going to do much for you. He wants all. Because if you give him all that you have, he can multiply it and make it more. But if you're withholding this from him and you're withholding that from him, and you're going to get weary in well-doing. Because your strength, you're only going to go so far on your own strength. Let me explain grace to you like this. When God has anointed you and appointed you to do a thing, you can do that with grace and anointing and energy and zeal and passion as long as He gives you grace to do it. You don't get tired. I mean, you get a little tired, but sleep fixes it. Pray a little, and that fixes it. But when he has lifted that thing from you to do, your, in other words, your assignment is done, he lifts his grace from you. And then all of a sudden, the same thing you just whistled through, you're like, how on earth did I do this for two years? Every day. Because His grace carried you. But now it is lifted. I've got to recognize when that weakness comes that it's time for me to pull back. Because if He's not helping me do it, I don't need to do it. There's a difference between God compassion and human compassion. God's compassion, com compassion heals to save. His purpose is save. His purpose is restoration and reconciliation. His purpose is to bring you back to Him, not to make your life down here easy without Him. I'm going to say that again. His job is not to make your life down here easy without Him. So why are we trying to make sinners' life easier 
without Him. That's what we do. We get in the way because of our human compassion. And we feel like we need to feed them. We need to clothe them. We need to do this. We need to do that. We can do that. We help them here. We help them there. Well, the Bible is very clear. You can fish for them all day long and they're not going to grow. But if you teach them to fish, they can learn to take care of themselves. And they can grow. So there comes a point when your human compassion interferes with God's compassion. You're doing things for people because you can, not because He said to. Remember, we are bought with a price. We are not our own. And it don't matter what your religious friend says about you. We have cell phones. We ain't got to pull over for everybody on the side of the road on the way to the church house and miss an entire day of services because I'm changing somebody's tire. They got a phone, and there's 24-hour emergency services. You know, oh, Pastor, that's hard. Now, if the Holy Ghost tells you to move over and witness, then you move over and you witness. But that's why you walk by the Spirit. Because otherwise, that's just to distract you from the healing you need in His house. That's just to distract you from the service He needs you to render in the house. Maybe there's somebody only you can pray for and minister to on the way of the house and the enemy throws in a curveball pulling your human compassion over for you to help somebody that don't care about God at all and there's somebody in the house he needs you to minister to that's trying desperately to live for God. Your human compassion will weary you when God says, I'm not in that. He said, you're going to have the poor with you always. Because some people choose to be poor. Oh, that's rough. America, there's really not anybody that's poor. I'm sorry. Even the homeless have cell phones. Even the homeless have EBT cards. Even the homeless, have, they have technology. Now, once you travel on over to Ethiopia, once you travel on over to a third world country where they don't have those things, they're poor. America's poor aren't really poor. And God is not going to bless the lazy. Why is it right for me to work three jobs and pay for, some, for you to eat when you won't even work one? That's the, I, I feel the Holy Ghost right there. Why am I working three jobs to take care of my family and the house of God and minister to the people of God and you can't get off your lazy derriere and work one job and you expect me to come pay for you? That's human compassion. Best thing I can say is no, you're well able, get up and go get a job like the rest of us. But I will minister to your spiritual needs and I'll tell you this. He that won't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. That means an unbeliever. Because if you believe, then you understand your role is to provide as a man. Everybody understand human compassion and God compassion? Am I going to get in the way? Of... God's word doesn't change. But Jesus is the word made flesh. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, you receive Jesus inside of you, and He can tell you what He means by His Word. You need both. You need spirit. You need bread. You need water. You need bread. You eat bread without water, you're going to choke. You can drink all day long, but if you don't have bread, you'll be weak. You're going to fast for three days. You drink water, you'll make it. <laughs> You remove water and bread, you might die. Because your, your body can only go so far without water. But you will be weak for three days because there's no bread. You, you, can go, you can go a while on bread. But Jesus said, I don't live on bread alone. We're not supposed to live on bread alone. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, and I'm, I'm, I'm the, 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 the runway is lit up and the wheels are coming down. Coming in for that landing. 
1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, everybody say love. I am nothing. And though I, listen, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, look what I did. Look what I'm doing. When you took that selfie of you feeding the poor, that's all the fame you're going to get. That's all the reward you're going to get. You just threw away any eternal reward for feeding that homeless person. Because you wanted somebody to know, look at me. Look how good I am. I don't know if it might have been Elmo speaking, I'm not sure. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned even, and have not charity or love, it profited me nothing. I let my body be burned for nothing. I gave to the poor for nothing. It didn't matter. It didn't count. It doesn't profit. Why? Because I'm not in love with Jesus. I don't have His love. And if I don't have His love, none of that means anything. That's why in Revelation He said, you better go back to your first love. Who is that? Me! Your first love is Jesus. Your first works is repentance. Because that's what brought you into relationship. Repentance is what acknowledged I've been an idiot trying to do this all by myself. Making a mess of it. But when I come under you and I come into love, then I have peace and I, my, my, my way is made for me. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Let's stand together. Psalm 27 and 14, wait on the Lord. It's better for you to wait on the Lord than to wait on a homeless man. Yeah. Oh, that, uh, that didn't set right with the religious spirit. I said it's better to wait on the Lord than it is to wait on a homeless person. Yeah. It's better to wait on the Lord than it is a, a, a car with a busted tire on the side of the road. It's better for you to wait on the Lord than to just do good. Because your works isn't going to save you. He is. You will be rewarded for your good works. But he said it's going to profit you nothing if you do it without love. And if you fail to be in a meeting with him daily and to walk with him and, and let him lead you into what things you get involved in and what things you don't get involved in, then you've left your first love and now you're just doing it so you look good and you're supposed to. And we get weary because His anointing and grace is not there to do it. You've taken on too much and you're doing it without Him. In fact, you've said to Him, I can do this myself. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You said, I, I, can, work in, I can work five jobs and take care of my family. The Lord wants you to work one to be in this house and teach your family's Bible studies and teach them how to pray and teach them how to walk with God while you out here trying to work five and you don't talk to Him at all. You better get rid of the four <laughs> and do the one that takes care of your needs and keep this right. Keep this love connection. Keep this prayer right. Matthew 26, 39 through 41, and I'm closing. Well, let me give, did I give 27 or 14? That's a good one. Throw it up there. Psalm 27 and 14. It ain't coming up, I'll read it. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Sometimes it takes more courage to wait. Are you hearing me? Sometimes it takes more courage to stand still and wait and let God work something out. We want to fix it. We want to put out all the fires, but if we let Him, He'll take care of the root. 
And then there'll be no more fires. Be, it takes courage to wait. And he shall strengthen what? My heart. He'll strengthen my heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. If anybody knew that, it was the psalmist David because his enemies surrounded him often. But he would wait. And he would pray and say, do I go up? And the Lord would say, go up. So he'd go. And then he'd pray, do I go up? And the Lord would say, no, hold your peace. And he'd chill. And the Lord would fight him back. We can learn from David. Matthew 26, 39 through 41, and then I just want us to find a place to pray and talk to God about these three weaknesses, our flesh, Satan, and human compassion fatigue. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, This is Jesus speaking, O my Father, if it be possible. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will. You got to reach a point where you don't care what people think or say about you because you're walking in His will. Well, why didn't you show up to this? And why didn't you show up to that? Because the Lord didn't want me there. I'm sorry that disappointed you, but I'm going to stay in His will. Don't let people's expectations of you keep you from Him Amen. and from where He wants you to be and what He wants you to be doing because that's going to be more fulfilling and long-term than what people and their opinions are going to do for you. He said, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He cometh unto the disciples and he finds them asleep. And I'm disappointed in disciples everywhere, including myself, when he needs us and we're sleeping because we're weak. We're too tired. We try to do too much on our own. We fled our flesh and not our spirit. We become afraid of the enemy instead of attacking the enemy. What could you watch with me? One hour? How hard is it really in a 24-hour day to give God an hour of prayer? Really? 24 hours. You work 8 to 10. You sleep 4 to 6 to 8, depending on who you are. You eat for a couple. You have 4 or 5 hours left. How hard is it to watch and pray with Him? It's a matter of what? discipline. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. What's going to happen when you don't pray? When you don't watch? You're going to walk right into temptation. That temptation may be what leads you to curse or say something wrong on the job and you lose your job and you lose your income and the struggle starts. That temptation may cause you to say something you shouldn't have said to a friend or a family and all the drama cuts loose. And takes your sleep for a week. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. You're going to have this stuff until you die. Or you're raptured. You're going to have to deal with flesh. But after a while walking and learning to be with Jesus... You've got to learn the principles of what the Spirit can do and what this flesh don't want to do. And what if I make it do what the Spirit wants? There will always be energy, effort, reward, and blessing following the Spirit, life everlasting, than this flesh that's going to bring corruption. So I just want us to pray. I know I feel like in the Holy Ghost that several of us are dealing with fatigue. We're tired. We're weary. We're weak. And the Lord said, here's three areas that's causing your weakness. And some of it might be all three. I'm having to go through my little checklist. 
But if you'll give that hour to Jesus and you'll keep plugged in and pray in the Spirit as often as possible, Paul said, I pray in tongues more than you all. Why? He was also the guy being shipwrecked two and three times and beaten and left for dead several times. Yeah, I bet he did pray in tongues more than you all. I mean, if you was being shipwrecked and beaten and tossed and left for dead and stones coming at you, why? Because he was perpetuating the gospel. He had given his life to preaching and teaching, and so the enemy hated his guts, throwing everything he had at him. Yeah, I'm going to be in touch with heaven all day long. Ain't got time to sidestep. Got to get a hold of Jesus. Come on, let's find a place to pray.